All righty. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all here. Um, something that whenever I'd preach in the harp especially, I'd warn the sound booth people a lot uh, that uh, I don't know exactly what's going to come out of my mouth, but I know the scriptures are in order. And so that is something that uh, I always have a lot of things going through my head. I'm always, uh, I'm a rambler. I, I was born to be a rambling man, apparently. And so first thing we'll do is immediately start off on prayer so that it is God's word that is coming out of my mouth, led by his spirit and not my own. So if you would, please join me in prayer real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for just the honor um, uh, of being able to share your word here uh, in front of a congregation. It's always a privilege to be able to dive into your word and share it and, and discover things about it together. And I pray that today it is your words and your will that's being done, that it, uh, it is your presence here and your spirit that is felt within this room, and that uh, it is not my own words that we're sharing. I thank you so much for everybody who is here today and everybody that, who will be able to watch this later. Uh, I thank you for the blessing of having them here, getting to know them, um, and I pray that uh, uh, you just allow us to have a blessed day. It's in your name I pray, and in your son's name especially we pray, amen. So, man, it, it is so interesting. I've been in ministry now for, oh, you know, I don't know if I could count that high now, uh, um, because I remember the first time that I ever did anything ministry related, it was actually Mark who asked me to do a Devo on a Mexico trip. Um, it was just fresh out of high school, um, and that was probably the, the first thing I remember really doing. And so growing up, attending here, riding on the attendance pads as a little kid over here when Chris Reynolds would be preaching. Uh, uh, there's a lot of, like, it's kind of weird. It's, uh, there's some emotions going on that it's just so cool that I'm finally able to be here and share with so many of you that uh, saw me grow up and, and, uh, and so many that I, I, we don't know each other. And so it's a privilege to be here. But um, hopefully, uh, hopefully I can keep it. I actually had, a, my wife bought a watch for me so I can try to keep track of time because, you know, there's a fine line between a long sermon and a hostage situation. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully you can trust me to try to keep you from not starving or, or rioting or, or whatever. We'll go through. Uh, but it actually kind of reminds me of a, a bit of a story. Um, there's this preacher who's preparing a sermon, and it's been it's just a horrible blizzard all weekend. It's been snowing and blowing, and it's just... It's terrible, and Sunday morning rolls around, and the snow is all the way up to his window. And, but he says, you know what, I'm going, to, I'm going to fight my way to the church, because you never know when someone might show up. So he fought his way through the icy wind and the snow, and he got to church. And he's sitting there, a church starts at a certain time, and he's sitting there reading about 10 minutes, and he's about ready to give up on people showing up, and the doors open. And this weary gentleman comes in from the back, all by himself. He also braved the weather, and, and the preacher's excited to see somebody, but he says, you know, I think you're the, you're the only one. We may have to cancel church today. And the, the gentleman says, Pastor, if you had a big herd of sheep and only one came home at night to feed, would you still feed them? And the preacher was just amazed, and he was excited. He's like, you know what? You're right. And so he got up there and he preached the best sermon he had ever preached. He preached from Genesis all the way to Revelation, hitting everything in between. And uh, it was, uh, he was just filled with the Spirit and he preached his heart out. And afterwards he says, brother, did that satisfy you? And the man said, pastor, if you had a herd of sheep and only one came home to feed at night, would you make him eat the whole bale? <laughs> so hopefully we'll avoid that today. Uh, hopefully you can trust me to stay on task and to not uh, take up your entire day. And this week I was going to go through um, one of the smaller books of the Bible because I thought, you know what, I'll scare you right off the bat and say we're going to go through a whole book of the Bible today. But that's not what God led me down. He kept popping up this one phrase in my head, this one word, that, and, and that is trust. Uh, it, that just kept popping in my head. And so, we're gonna, okay, 
well, I'll just dive in and we'll start diving in about trust. And, and that's, it's a big deal. It's a big word. It can be hard to do sometimes because when we're talking about trust, usually we're thinking uh, trusting our family, trusting our family to take care of us, our parents to take care of us, um, our, our grandparents when they're watching us not to forget about us, um, which didn't happen, but I thought it did when I was a kid. Uh, but my, my grandpa was uh, an ornery cuss, and he decided, you know what, they're off playing on the playground. I'm just going to pull around the block, make them think I forgot about them. Freaked me out. Worked. But, but I think of trust like that. Maybe you're thinking of uh, trusting a best friend. Trusting a best friend to uh, not give away your secrets until they become your best man at your wedding, and then your parents find out stuff that they didn't know before, and you have a long conversation afterwards. Uh, I'm not bitter. But... Uh, no, it was, uh, we find people that we trust because that's, that's how we build our, our relationships with people. We surround ourselves with people that we can depend on, that have our back, that will help us out, that we will help out. It's a mutual thing. Uh, but there's a level of trust that goes beyond that, and, and that's the trust that we have with God, in God, with Jesus. It's such a deep level of trust that, that has various ways to trust and that are, um, uh, depending on where we're at in our life, different levels. Uh, maybe a new believer, just learning what it means to trust God and, and starting to get into the, the, just the beginning relationship with them. Uh, a long-term believer that's developed this trusting relationship for years. There's different ways, different levels to develop it. Uh, so we can start off by trusting God now. Trusting God today can be easy. It can be hard. It can be easy when times are going good. But it also can be hard to, when times are going good because sometimes we just lose sight of things. We get caught up in the moment, the routine, and, and we're, we're just riding along with it nice and easy. And, and we can forget. But when times are good, it also can be easy to follow. We have plenty of examples of scripture, uh, in scripture, of people trusting God. One of the things that popped in my head when I'm thinking trusting God now is actually when God calls the disciples. We're going to look at Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. That is Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Hopefully you can read it on the screen. If not, you can look at it uh, there in your Bible in front of you or your Bible app. Luke chapter 5, 1 through 11. Now it happened that while a crowd was pressing around him, this is Jesus, and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. I know I butchered that, but that's okay. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake. But the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into the boat, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out to a little distance from the land. Now when he had finished speaking, he said uh, to Simon, put into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon responded to him saying, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. There's a level of trust that we see right there. And when they had done this, they had caught a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners at the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled up both boats to the point to where they were sinking. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions, because the catch of fish was uh, which they had taken. And likewise also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear, from now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats into land, they left everything and followed him. They followed him. They left everything. They were amazed at his authority. They listened to him. They took the boats out. They were amazed at the fact that they had caught nothing all night and then when commanded to throw their nets over the edge by Jesus, they were catching so much their nets were tearing 
and then two boats were beginning to sink because they had so much. They listened to him, and ultimately at the end there, we see that they had dropped everything to follow him. They trusted Jesus so much, uh, and, and maybe they knew him a bit before because they're in the same area, knew of Jesus, knew of his teachings, but still there's a level of trust there that is just so great to be able to follow him. Drop everything. And that's their livelihood, and they're leaving it behind to follow him. We see it also in Matthew 9.9. 9. Oh, it would help if I followed along there. This is new to me. It's fun. <laughs> I might get distracted by it, but that's all right, especially once I found out there's a laser light. Anna shouldn't have told me that. I could be like a cat with this thing. <laughs> but Matthew 9.9, 9, Jesus calls Matthew the tax collector. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's office. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. This is an outcast. Matthew is a tax collector, which means he's a Jew that's collecting taxes for the Roman Empire. And in order for Matthew to keep some welfare for himself, to earn an income, he has to increase the taxes a little bit because Rome's wanting a certain number. And Matthew has to add to it so he can have some income. And so the Jews, his fellow Jews, really don't like him. He's a sellout. He's someone who's scamming his own people. But Jesus calls him, and he follows him. After this, actually, Matthew not only follows him, he goes back to his house and has a, a banquet, has a feast in Jesus' honor. And he follows him. Now, whether times are hard or times are bad, it can be easy or hard to follow and trust Jesus. It can be hard to give things up, especially when we look at these passages and think they dropped everything and they gave it up for him. They trust him so much to follow him and forget everything else. That can be kind of hard. I've often thought in my own head if I was told to do that, uh, which in a way we are in ministry. Um, would I be able to? Because I think of, of when it is hard to do that. I think of the, the rich young ruler. In Mark 10, 17 through 27. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? But Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except for God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud uh, and honor your father and mother. And he said, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth. Looking at him, Jesus showed love to him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go and sell all, your, all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But he was deeply dismayed by these words, and he went away grieving, for he, uh, oh, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it? Uh, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus responded again and said to them, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were even more astonished. And he said to, uh, and he said to them, Then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, With people it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. It can be hard to give up and, and things and follow Jesus, to follow God, to trust Him. It can be hard to trust with uncertainty. Uh, it, it can be easy to trust in the moment, right now. But it can be hard to trust with the uncertainty of things to come. But Jesus, not only do we have examples of the disciples and how they trusted God, Jesus shows us an example of how he trusted God. We see that right after he was baptized. He went into the wilderness for 40 days, and he was fasting. I'll, I'll, I'll admit, the longest I've ever fasted is 36 hours. I could not imagine trying to fast for 40 days. 
And I will also admit when I broke the fast, Taco Bell is not a great way to break a fast. <laughs> but he was demonstrating trust. Trust in God. Trust in God now. And he was also showing us to trust God with tomorrow. And sometimes that can be harder because it's, it's easier to trust for today when we have a little bit more control. I don't have any control over tomorrow. But maybe it can be easier to trust God with that. Who better to give your trust to? Who better to lean on? Whether it is times in our nation, uh, how we see things growing up, how we see things from years ago to now, uh, whether it's the things our youth deals with, whether it's the thing in our, in our own personal lives. It seems like more illnesses and stuff just keep popping up as time goes on. It can be tough to trust in God in times of uncertainty. And yet, Jesus has a solution for us there too. Matthew 6, 25-34 uh, one of my favorite passages to preach on, um, but I, I won't go into a whole full sermon on this one, even though I do have one in my back pocket for it. But it's Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Let me go back one. There we go. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor your, for your body as to what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather crops into barns, and yet our Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more important than they? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single day to his lifespan? And why are you worried about clothing? Notice how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor, nor do they spin thread or cloth. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself by one of the, like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what are we to eat, or what are we to drink, or what are, we going, uh, what are we wearing for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all things will be provided to you. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. Um... The first time I ever preached on that passage was 11 years ago in June. And uh, I, would, I, did my, uh, I did my internship for school, and I'm very thankful. Again, it's an emotional attachment here, because uh, I came to you guys. Mark, speaking of uh, missions, I came to you guys and, uh, to raise support, because I did my internship in Brisbane, Australia. Now I will admit, I, looking back, I did not do the best of keeping you guys up to date on it. And for that, I apologize. But... I am thankful for you guys sending me there. And uh, one of the reasons I did this sermon there was because they have that good phrase, ah, no worries, Mike. They say that all the time. And, uh, of course, I grew up watching Crocodile Dundee, and I guess when I was real little, I said I wanted to go to Australia. And after uh, I was baptized and was going to church camp, I guess I came home telling my mom, I want to go on a missions trip to Australia. And I had forgotten all about that, but it came true, especially thanks to you guys and thanks to the Lord. Uh, but they say that so much there, no worries. And so uh, I, I talked about that. And, and it's easy to say, ah, no worries. I even catch myself saying it in text messages all the time, ah, no worries. It's easy to say, hard to do. But there's a reason Jesus told us to do that. Don't worry about tomorrow. Trust in me about tomorrow. You'll be provided for. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Trust in God tomorrow because He's the one who can reveal and show us what He's wanting us to do. 
Sometimes it is clear, sometimes it is quick, sometimes it is not so clear right away, and sometimes it is not so quick, but he's still going to take care of us. It takes time. I think about this process, being here. After we left the children's home, uh, I was ready to get, well, I thought I was ready, to get back into a full-time ministry right away because it's what I went to school for, it's what I had a passion for, uh, but God was telling me to slow down. Uh, I worked two years at the meat locker because that's where God wanted me. I was making connections there. I was helping to reach out to people who were unchurched. I was interacting with kids that, uh, when I was in La Harp, would have been in my youth group. They're, they're that age, a uh, 22-year-old kid that had been in church maybe three times his whole life. That's including weddings. And so being able to answer questions that he had, get him a Bible, or, or pray with one of the other ladies there that's a strong believer, um, talk to other individuals, uh, interact with the Catholic, and, and be able to kind of talk about uh, um, his faith and beliefs and why he does what he does, it was where God wanted me at the time. And actually, um, it was when I, I went to Mark to get some premarital counseling material for a, a wedding I'm going to do in uh, this summer, that uh, Mark said, hey, you know, it might not hurt if you send in a resume. And so I was like, hey, that's all I needed. That's what I was waiting. Because everything I had been pursuing at that time, God was closing that window because I wasn't ready. Uh, he was showing me, hey, I will let you know where I want you. I will let you know where I need you and when I need you. And uh, I can thank Mark for... God using him to let me know uh, when I was supposed to be here. And it was a two-year journey. So sometimes our plans don't go as planned, but God's plans always do. And we can trust him with tomorrow because he knows what's best. He has a plan. And we can trust him not just for tomorrow, um, and not just for today, uh, but we can trust in him always. John 14, 1, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. That's Jesus speaking. We can trust in him and believe in him. Believe in Jesus and trust and follow him because my plans aren't sufficient enough. Um, again, letting you get to know me a little bit more, it was uh, uh, my last year as a camper. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And so I went up to, because uh, Mark was already praying with someone, I uh, went up to Nathan Cooper, who you got to listen to during Mark's sabbatical, um, preacher out of New London. At the time, he was youth minister in Monmouth. And I walked up to him and I said, I have no idea what I want to do with my life, so uh, would you pray with me to see what God wants me to do with my life? And uh, so he did. And the next day, I got a scholarship to Ozark Christian College. I didn't go there, because even with that scholarship, it was a little too pricey for me, so I went to Central. But then after I got that scholarship, Nathan walked up to me and said, do you know now? I said, yeah. So we can trust God now, we can trust God with tomorrow, and we can trust God forever. I knew then that I didn't know where my path would lead, and I had no idea it would lead me to Missouri like three times and then back to Illinois and all that kind of stuff. But I knew no matter what happens, I'm following God. I'm trusting Him. And I want Him to use me to do His work, to do His will. So we can trust Him forever. We can trust Him with our finances. We can trust Him with our health. We can trust Him with our future. We can trust Him with our salvation. And we can trust Him with our eternity. And again, things may not go as we plan, but they will be for His glory. Hebrews 13, 5 through 8 says this. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever abandon you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Remember those who led you who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their way of life, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can trust him because of God's word, 
of all the things written in it. We can trust him by the example that we have before us in Jesus Christ and the disciples in those in the Old Testament. Abraham, huge example of trusting God right there. We can trust him because God doesn't change. Jesus doesn't change. He keeps his promises and he's the same always. Right here, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We change, but he does it. He is that foundation. He is that rock that's never moving. Isaiah 26, verse 4. Trust in the Lord forever, for in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. We have an everlasting rock. Trust in the Lord forever. Like I said, it can be hard to do, but man, when we can do that, how much more joy and peace do we have in our lives? No matter what kind of things are thrown at us, we have that foundational rock that is Jesus Christ, that is God. We have the one who said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. We have the one to trust that says that he is the living water. We have the one who we can trust that is the life bread, who is the true vine, the good shepherd, the good door for the sheep, the light of the world, the one who gave it all for us, our salvation, the one who was sent by God to die for us on the cross so that we may be saved. So again, we can trust God now, we can trust God with tomorrow, and we need to trust him forever. Not just because I'm not, not because I'm saying it, not because Mark believes it, not because any of the leaders here believe it, but because it's true. It's, God shows it to us through His Word. He shows it to us through the fact that He sent Jesus to die for us when we didn't deserve it, we did nothing to earn it, but it was a gift of salvation, uh, salvation that was given to us. So, that being said, I want to invite you to trust God, not just now, or with tomorrow, but with everything, forever. He is the eternal rock. And we will get the wonderful privilege of not just worshiping Him here, but someday, after the day of judgment, when we are all gone, uh, unless He comes back before we're uh, in our lifetime, if we're gifted enough and blessed enough for Him to come back in our lifetime, we'll be able to worship at His feet for eternity. It'll be wonderful. So maybe you are, are, are new here. Maybe you're a, a new believer. Maybe you're a believer that's been here for a very long time. I invite you to just open up your hearts and minds to this. And uh, feel free to come speak to any of us. I mean, any of us. We'll have our, our elders around, um, Mark, myself, Dan, um, or anyone like, a, like when I was sitting in this pew, these pews, I, I, there's a few of you still here today with us, and there's a few that are no longer with us that uh, just are always people I could turn to. I pray that you have those people and that they are here today. Uh, I invite you to do so. I'm going to go ahead and pray one more time, and uh, thank, you for, thank you for being here. It's been a true blessing.